Uh, good evening to all of you, whoever is listening to me. Uh, this is a class that's supposed to be a pre-exam class, like a uh, fast revision. Uh, I've taken only one aspect of neurology, that is also paraplegias and that too, acute paraplegias. I'm not talking of chronic paraplegias at all, because it's impossible to cover in one class. So we will present about uh, uh, 12 cases of uh, acute paraplegias. And then I will give uh, uh, an approach to paraplegias and then we conclude. I'll try to keep it uh, uh, quick and we should be able to finish in one hour. Okay. If I'm too fast, you can uh, uh, tell Sanket and he'll probably tell me. But otherwise, I intend to be fast. Uh, is there a chat box, Sanket, where they will be messaging or something? Yes, ma'am, that is enabled. So uh, if yeah, something is yeah. there, they can answer. Yeah. Okay. So the answer, then I will look at the chat box. Okay. Right, fine. Okay, done. Okay. Okay, fine. Now, uh, these are case presentations of acute paraplegia only. Uh, keep a pen and paper ready to make the best use of these discussions. Pen and paper or your phone somewhere you answer before I give you the answer because it's like a test for you so that uh, you know where you stand. And emphasis is only on clinical history and examination. I'm not talking about the theory except one or two you know, passing remarks. I will not go into the theory around it at all. Okay, More of a clinical visit. So we start with case number one. 30 year old play clerk found it difficult to get up from her chair two days ago. Yesterday, she could not lift her upper limbs to wear her blouse. She can grip a pen, wear chappals, and has no problems with passing urine. On questioning, she has some tingling of both lower limbs in the soles. On arrival in the hospital, she became breathless and had to be intubated. What's the diagnosis? Quick on the chat box, please. Anybody? Anybody wants to guess what this is? Okay, nobody is answering. Uh, this is a probable billion barry syndrome because it's a short onset, first starting in the lower limbs, then going to the upper limbs, and uh, the distal muscles are not involved. Only proximal progressed on to a respiratory weakness had to be intubated. Okay? That's very simple. What history would you ask for? This is the history that you will ask for. That is respiratory infection, vaccination, GI infection two to four weeks ago. What organisms will you think of? Anybody? What organisms will you think of? Click on the chat box, please. Anybody? Okay, I think this is not working. Uh, I'll just answer and go on. And we got the reply. It's uh, Campylobacter disease. Okay, somebody has written. Okay. Yeah, Campylobacter, yeah, like UCV, CMV, Lyme's disease. All these are the organisms. Why the gap? The gap is the time taken to form the antibodies. And vaccinations like COVID are very important, especially the mRNA vaccines of COVID. They're well known to cause neurological problems. So that is important. Now, where is the lesion in a GBS? The lesion is a lower motor neuron. Anterior uh, roots are involved. That is the motor roots are involved. As you can see, this is the anterior horn cell. I mean, this is the spinal cord. This is the anterior horn cell. These are the motor nerve roots. They're joining together to form uh, the combined nerve root and then they are going and you know this is the area where it is involved. So it's an acute inflammatory polyradiculopathy, uh, short form called as AIDP. Uh, as we have told in lower motor neuron, there are seven levels. One is the anterior horn cell, then the nerve root, then the combined nerve root, then you have the nerve, then you have the neuromuscular junction and the muscle. The motor, uh, uh, pure motor is always in the beginning and the end. Please remember that. So in the anterior horn cell and maybe the anterior motor root and then in the end, that is the neuromuscular junction and the muscle, these are the only four areas where you get pure motor. In everything in between, you would get a sensory mix. Okay. So that's how you remember the seven levels of lower motor neuron. So once you make out something is lower motor neuron, then you have to think that uh, if it is pure motor, the problem is either in the beginning or in the end. If there is a sensory mix, then it has to be wherever there is a combination of the sensory root coming here, that is at the level of the 
combined root, the plexus, or the peripheral nerve. Okay, very simple way of remembering. Pure motor is only in the beginning or in the end. Right. Now, uh, what will be the examination findings? If you can predict the examination findings as a flaccid paralysis, most often it's an ascending paralysis. Rarely you can get a descending paralysis also, but it is very rare. The symmetrical motor weakness, no sensory loss, no bladder, no bowel. Now, regarding the motor weakness, like we said, ascending, proximal more than distal, areflexia, hypotonia. Why? Because it's lower motor neuron. It's an acute onset, it's only two days. How long do the deficits progress? Deficits progress for at least two to four weeks, which is the outer limit of, of the time given for the deficits. After that, if they continue to progress, we have to think of a different thing and we have to look for autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Why intubation? Intubation is because of respiratory par muscle paralysis uh, or the C3-C4 involvement. How do we judge which patient may need? We have to do a single, single breath count, less than 25. If they score on that, they probably are having a respiratory uh, muscle strength, uh, poor respiratory muscle strength. Arm abduction is C5. So all patients, when you go on rounds, please look for C5. If C5 is involved, then probably the C4 will come next. Vital signs are always BP standing and lying should be done. What is the classification of this thing? This classification, all of you know, what we described is the ADP. You can get axonal variants like Aman, Amsan, okay, sensory neuropathy, dysautonomia, and then Miller Fisher and oropharyngeal and pharyngocervical brachial. These are all, all of you know. Miller Fisher and this thing overlapping can occur. Now, let me go to the next problem. 35 year old man who had pneumonia two weeks ago came with diplopia. On day two, he became drowsy and had irrelevant talk. He has palsy of three, four, six cranial nerves, and his NCV showed reduced CAMs and uh, reduced SNAPs. His anti GQ1B antibodies were positive. What is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis for this patient? Patient is having a pneumonia two weeks ago, now has diplopia. He has got involvement of these cranial nerves, and he has got anti GQ1B antibodies positive. What is the diagnosis? Just look at the chat now. Okay, somebody yeah. said Miller Fisher. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Somebody is saying Miller Fisher. Fair enough. So let me just. Okay. It's a bigger staff with Miller Fisher. Please understand when the patient has drowsiness and irrelevant talk, then the bigger staff's encephalitis comes in. The Miller Fisher is your 346 with ataxia, areflexia, ophthalmoplegia. Together, they've been called the anti GQ1. B antibody syndrome because this is the antibody that is present in all three. So additional findings when you're asked, when you're seeing a GB syndrome, you should look for additional findings of 2, 7, 3, 4, 6, sensory for Amsan, drowsiness for bigger stuffs, and ataxia and ophthalmoplegia for Miller Fisher. Little more about Miller Fisher, external ophthalmoplegia. It's not a, a, a pupil involvement, bilateral, sources is possible, rarely can present with an INO. Ataxia, areflexia, all of you know. Few questions. Why two? Two is involved because of papilledema can occur because of high CS of protein. Peculiarity of seven is bilateral is possible. Now, you should all know the causes of other bilateral seventh nerve palsy. Okay. Three or four causes you should know, like leprosy, sarcoid, uveoperatitis, all those things which are usually told. You should know the other causes of a bilateral seventh. That's a very common exam question. Where is the lesion? You, how will you prove it? You have to do the NCV, conduction block, demyelination pattern. LP findings, albuminocytological dissociation, normal in the first week. So you have to probably do the LP at the end of one week because only 50% will have positive. Please remember, it is not a 100% positive uh, investigation. Then this is the, uh, the antibodies that you see. That, so you have seen the usual things are all here. The variants we are talking about. So this is what I described to you. GQ1B, this is what is present in Miller Fisher's bigger staffs and AIDP. Okay. So you, if you want, you can mug up these things. Management, I'm not going into it. IBAG and plasmapheresis, equal efficacy and prognosis. Must be started early for you to get any result. Okay. Let's go on to the next problem. 45 year old man is admitted with paraplegia of two days duration. Thought to have GBS and an LP is done. Repeating again, 45 year old man, paraplegia, two days. Thought to have GBS and LP is done. It shows high protein, 300 cells, mostly lymphocytes. What are your possibilities? Looks like GB, but there's a pleocytosis. What are your possibilities? Quick answers, please. Anybody? Quick answers. 
not sure okay you got hiv and lymphoma good okay okay hiv and lymphoma so let's go past this slide i think whenever they answer my slide doesn't move okay sarcoid lymphoma and hiv are the three uh, conditions which mimic uh, gb but have leiocytosis that's what you should pick but you have something called a secondary gbs which is different it is not a dd it can happen post chemotherapy and sle and sometimes in the malignancy like lymphoma also which is called secondary gb associated gb can come but otherwise hiv sarcoid and lymphoma are the three classical dds of a gb which looks like a pleocytosis going on to case number 2 40 year old lady is brought with paraplegia of a days duration a 40 year old lady paraplegia of one day duration can't pass urine feels no sensation below the waist she has got blurring of the right eye but all other cranial nerves are normal so blurring of the right eye all other cranial nerves are normal what is the diagnosis what is the treatment i think this is a very easy thing i want to emphasize one important principle in neurology the history gives the etiology the examination tells you what are the deficits and confirms the level please remember history gives the etiology hemiplegia from any any kind of lesion will present the same findings but the history gives you the etiology the examination tells you what are the neurological deficits and confirms the level so let's analyze this history 40 year old lady paraplegia one day duration can't pass urine no sensation this thing so one day duration is acute bladder is involved sensory level is there there's a level and there's a right eye blurring so once there is a sensory level it is in the cord maybe t8 because you cannot feel below the waist blurring is is a sticking out like a sore thumb so then you have to think of some other cause so transverse cord lesion this you all know below that level everything is lost motor is becomes upper motor neuron sensory at the level becomes hyperesthetic and then below it is lost this you all know so when you analyze there's a cord plus i multiple sites are involved then you think of multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitica optica spectrum disorders so it is called nosd right first attack we can't differentiate what it is okay so that's how it is examination findings 2 bar 5 in both lower limbs dtrs are absent plantar up going dtrs are absent because of shock plantar gives tells you still upper motor neuron eye examination visual activity decrease pupils are abnormal and sensory level at t8 all modalities are absent below so what about the eye findings you can get visual loss you can get rapd you can get optic neuritis you can get retrobulbar neuritis you know all those things and ms you can get an ino and ino is very characteristic of an ms nystagmus can also be a feature in an ms so sensory you know transverse level cord is involved all sensations below all doesn't differentiate between pain temperature and post column hyperesthesia at the level below is anesthesia above is normal uh one small thing uh the sensory level and the motor level need not coincide because the sensory fibers will actually climb up for a few segments and then go up please remember that so when you present a paraplegia you are going to tell what is the sensory level what is the motor level what is the reflex level some levels you can't make out reflex so you got a big gap in the uh, in the dermatomes okay and between motor and sensory please remember they need not always coincide sensory is a very definite level very definite because if you get a cord uh, definite level that's your sensory okay fine the motor can be plus minus because for example upper abdominal lower abdominal you got three three segments god knows what it is okay fine differentiation between neuromyelitis optica and your ms transverse myelitis please remember in a neuromyelitis is symmetrical and complete an optic neuritis is more symmetrical and severe please remember neuromyelitis is a bad one it is the worst compared to ms it is bad if you remember that you will remember this so in a transverse myelitis in a neuromyelitis optica it is symmetrical and complete the optic neuritis is also symmetrical and complete whereas the ms is in asymmetrical and incomplete and here also it's asymmetrical more recovery is possible extent you know multiple segments in an in a neuromyelitis whereas few segments in a in an ms area prostima and press involvement with vomiting and hiccups are features of neuromyelitis optica may not be present in an ms recurrence is very common in this and uh, this is up to four in four antibodies this is demyelination and progression this is episodic multiple uh, episodes can occur and the, you know the various varieties of ms i am not going to details but what i want you to remember is a neuromyelitis optica had much more symmetrical transverse myelitis much more symmetrical optic neuritis and it's a bad thing to have and can have involvement in the brain only in certain areas not in all areas as ms can be there 
everywhere in the brain. What is the closest differential diagnosis for MS? What is the closest differential diagnosis? It's not neuromyelitis. What is the closest differential? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, that's taking time. So I'm just going off. Okay, that's an ADEM. Okay, so that's an ADEM is the closest uh, differential of an MS. What are the differences of an ADEM versus an MS? The differences are the involvement of the encephalon. If you remember that, you can understand these two things. Alteration of consciousness and seizures, which are features of gray matter involvement. Remember, MS is a white matter involvement. Will not cause seizure, will not cause alteration in consciousness because it's only white matter involvement. Whereas in, a neuro, uh, in an ADEM, you get gray matter involvement. That's why you get the alteration in consciousness and the seizure. ADM is a single event, post-viral, periviral, whatever, you know, uh, that's how it is. Very bad episode, but patient actually recovers. And bilateral optic neuritis is more common in ADM, whereas unilateral eye involvement is common in MS. So those are your differentials between an ADM and your first attack of an MS. Please remember ADM is a single attack. Uh, MS is a uh, multiple attacks. But again, the first attack of an MS, you can't differentiate. Remember, gray matter, matter is never involved in an MS. It's a white matter disease. So that's why you do not get seizures or loss of consciousness. The rest are easy for you. I'm not going into this. This is your McDonald criteria for MS, and that's your criteria for neuromyelitis. I'm not going into this. The investigation that you do, LP, you're looking for a protein rise, pleocytosis, MRI showing the level in the cord, MS, uh, MS brain can be abnormal in an MS. Please understand that when you do the visual evoke potential and the SSCP, somatosensory evoke potentials, they can be abnormal in the presence of normal vision. Please understand the vision can be normal, yet you can get a VEP which is abnormal. That's how you document the second uh, lesion, uh, even though you don't have a symptom for that lesion. NMO, MRA brain can be normal except that area posthuma, which I told you, but most of the time, otherwise, NMO is actually normal. Aquaporin 4 antibodies are common in NMO. These are your differentiation with the uh, investigations. And again, when you do the MRI, you make out a single level, uh, long segment involvement in the NMO and a single level involvement in an MS that is known, multiple segments. And treatment, I won't go into it. Okay, I'm just leaving it off. Right. Going on to the next case. Phase three, 55 year old man is brought with loss of consciousness. Two days ago, he had severe headache and vomited. On examination, he has positive of movement of both lower limbs. DTRs are brisk, plantars are extensor. It does not move to painful stimulus. His bladder is catheterized and as he could not pass urine. What is the diagnosis? So the 55 year old man, loss of consciousness, severe headache, vomiting, develops a paraplegia, Pantars are upgoing, and then you've got a DTR, which is uh, brisk, does not move to painful stimulus because he's got a positive there. And then bladder is catheterized, he can't pass urine. So there's a bladder, there is a upper motor around this thing. So look at it, because he's got an LOC, headache and vomiting, it makes it intracranial. Positive of movements and plantars are brisk is UMN, bladder is catheterized. So intracranial cause, then you have to think of an acute cause again, Unpaired anterior cerebral artery thrombosis, no sensory may be there. So please remember, it can happen only if the ACA is unpaired. If you have two ACA, you cannot have a paraplegia, you'll get a monoplegia. So please remember that. So if you got an unpaired anterior cerebral, then you have this problem that that can be blocked by some you know problem. Then you can get a paraplegia. The biggest clue for you is the presence of intracranial symptoms. Once you get an intracranial symptom and you get a paraplegia and a bladder involvement because the parasagittal uh, uh, bladder areas are there, so that is why you have to think that it's an unpaired anterior artery thrombosis. Case number four, 70-year-old man is brought with paraplegia since 10 a.m. this morning. On examination, he has got zero power in both lower limbs. DTRs are not brisk, but plantar is extensor. He cannot feel touch and pain up to the chest wall but answers joint position sense correctly. Higher mental functions are normal. What is the diagnosis? So what is the diagnosis, anybody? 70-year-old man with paraplegia. Okay, anterior spinal artery thrombosis, correct. It's an anterior spinal artery thrombosis, isn't it? 
so yeah so the key words are he is brought with paraplegia since his morning so it's acute plantar dissections are don't worry about the dtrs because they are not brisk is shock cannot feel this is the biggest clue that you have that you have uh, pain and temperature being there but uh, being lost but the joint position sense is answering okay so that's the dissociation that you see that gives you the biggest clue to the presence of an anterospinal artery thrombosis so always whenever there is a sudden thing in neurology we always think it can be vascular or electrical right so vascular causes are sudden electrical causes like seizures are sudden the only other thing that can be sudden is trauma and the fourth thing can be a channelopathy there are only four things in neurology which can be sudden so this is the anterospinal artery remember there is one anterospinal two posterior spinal this anterospinal is supplying the whole part so that's why you are getting uh, corticospinal lateral spinal thalamic but posterior columns are spared uh, that's why you get this picture right now what are the other causes of dissociative sensory loss often asked question serings wallenberg leprosy and brown sequard syndrome okay we go to case number 5 a 30 year old man with is brought with sudden onset of limb weakness so he's got sudden onset of limb weakness he attended a marriage function had lunch and felt weak after that on arrival he could talk well but had grade 2 power in all limbs dtrs absent plantar's mute no sensory no cranial nerves what investigations would you ask so look at that problem again 30 year old man sudden onset of limb weakness attended a marriage function had lunch felt weak after that on arrival he could talk well but only grade 2 power okay dtrs are absent plantar is mute no sensory no cranial nerves what investigation would you ask what is the answer to that have you got the answer here potassium okay done correct so it's a potassium that you should ask okay so what we are looking at okay is the potassium it's always a differential diagnosis for a gp syndrome please remember uh, hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis is an important differential diagnosis for a gp syndrome because it is also pure motor it is also a sudden onset or an acute onset paraplegia or a quadriparesis now the biggest clue in this history that i gave you is this man went to a marriage function and he had a big meal he had a high carbohydrate diet the other precipitating factor that causes low potassium because the glucose drives the potassium into the cell remember when you treat with dextrose insulin dextrose enough alone is enough isn't it that itself will drive the potassium into the cell and cause hypokalemia so following a meal high carbohydrate diet other precipitating factors are stress and exercise okay i had a patient who whenever he ran he got a low potassium because he had that problem earlier on okay so stress exercise high carbohydrate meal and always ask for attacks of this kind of thing in childhood because usually hypokalemic periodic paralysis does not present first time in adulthood always look for thyrotoxicosis in the adults whenever you get a periodic paralysis your first possibility is always the first attack if it occurs over the age of 20 have to think of a thyrotoxicosis and may last a few hours okay why not inherited autos autosomal dominant why can't we think of those things because they occur in the first decade always look for gb how to differentiate this from a gb very important no cranial nerve involvement no respiratory paralysis in a periodic paralysis so unusual there is no no in medicine anywhere but it's unusual to have cranial nerves and unusual to have respiratory paralysis so if you find somebody with a quadriparesis with a respiratory paralysis please vote for gb syndrome versus any of the periodic paralysis because respiratory paralysis is uncommon in a patient with a periodic paralysis okay now how do we know we it's not a secondary cause for example you can say why can't it be an rta because between attacks the potassium will come to normal that's important to remember in all periodic paralysis the potassium does come to normal between attacks and patient also is normal between attacks he is fine so you can't think of some other cause of you know low potassium that is causing all these things that we can't think of okay fine now just want to go through this chart a little slowly with you now this is about hypokalemic periodic paralysis and then uh, this thing so if you look here 
Age of onset for this is first and second decade. It's only the thyrotoxic periodic paralysis that comes over the age of 20 years. And all these things are, uh, you know, occurring in the first decade. Attack frequency, if you look at it, uh, the infrequent, these are all infrequent. This is frequent. This is monthly. Okay. This is the Anderson. Okay. Then uh, the perspiring factors, if you look, most of them have exercise, except the last one, uh, which has rest after exercise, right? And uh, you have carbohydrate meal and stress, which are causing the hypokalemic, and then uh, fasting, which causes the hyperkalemic, and potassium rich food, which is causing the hyperkalemic. Stress is a factor everywhere. Potassium is low, low, normal, or elevated, low, normal, or elevated in an Anderson. Associated features, this can raise hypokalemic periodic paralysis can have later onset myopathy. This is thyrotoxic. That's why I told you features of thyrotoxicals are very important to you uh, whenever you're seeing an, in an adult, the first onset of a hypokalemic. Myotonia can get in hyperkalemic and uh, uh, dysmorphic features in Anderson. The etiology, this is autosomal dominant. All are autosomal dominant. That's why we have to ask for family history. Whereas in thyrotoxicosis, it is an inherited disposition, but occurs over the age of 20 years. Uh, pen interest, I'm not talking about. Epidemiology, clinical expression, men more frequently than uh, women. Uh, the highest incidence in Asians. That's why in anybody with a periodic paralysis here, we ask, always ask for a thyroid function test. Okay. Uh, the things, uh, treatment and all, you know. Okay. This, you treat the thyroid. Here, you give carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like diamox, potassium sparing diuretics. All these things can be given. That I'm not going to talk to you about. Uh, the only thing I wanted, uh, one thing I forgot to stress is, I had a patient with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis who had so many attacks in a day. Okay, very, very frequent attacks is usually hyperkalemic, right? Okay, fine. Right. The treatment for uh, uh, this periodic paralysis is administration of uh, potassium chloride incrementally, usually aborts acute attacks, okay? And uh, recovery may take minutes to hours. Usually we give 10 milliculars per hour. Why do you want to give it slowly? You don't want to give it fast because the potassium will move out of the cells and actually increase after the attack. You'll land up with a hyperkalemia. Okay, right. Fine. Go to the next case. 45-year-old diabetic. Am I okay? Is the speed okay or am I too fast? Sanket? I think ma'am, it's okay. Uh, so, no message yet with two parts of the message. Okay, no message. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll finish in about 15, 20 minutes. I'll be done. Okay. So, case number six, uh, 45 year old diabetic comes with high grade fever and upper backache for four days. So, he's got a high grade fever. He's got an upper backache for four days. Since yesterday, he has difficulty in walking, grade three power, both lower limbs, exaggerated reflexes, upgoing plantar. He has severe tenderness and warmth at T4. What is the diagnosis? What investigations and treatment are needed? So anybody on this patient coming with a four days history of high grade fever, backache, and then a paraplegia, and then he has got whatever. Okay, epidural abscess, right, good. That's an epidural abscess. So why we are thinking of epidural abscess? Because of the high grade fever, He's got an upper motor neuron, T4 is involved, and uh, investigations and treatment that are needed are, go to the next one, yeah. What I want you to remember is, there are two watersheds, right? There's a horizontal watershed and a vertical watershed in the spinal cord. The horizontal watershed is where the corticospinal sits between the supply of the anterior spinal and the posterior spinal. That's why one of the reasons for the corticospinal being involved early in any paraplegia is because it is sitting in the horizontal watershed. So if you compromise and produce ischemia of the cord, one of the first tracks to get involved is the corticospinal. There is a vertical watershed, which is, uh, you know, how you form the, uh, the spinal uh, blood supply to the spinal arteries from the intercostal arteries, artery of Adam Tevis and all that. And most of the vertical watershed is mid-thoracic, mid-thoracic. So that is when you start getting all these abscesses and things like that, they all come in mid thoracic. So there are two watersheds in the spinal cord. Now, what do you do for an epidural abscess? Obviously, you have to image, you can see the epidural abscess there, and then you have to go in and drain. Most of the time, the organisms are staph aureus, and that is what we usually treat with antibiotics, and we drain the abscess and then treat whatever the underlying condition is. Uh, it's, an, it's a neurosurgical emergency, and the paraplegia is reversible, and that is why it's very important to this thing. Just one point addition I want to add. 
that staphylococcal infections, when you have a staph aureus sepsis, you can get involvement of one, the heart. That is why you always do an echo in any staphylococcal sepsis because 25% you can get an infective endocarditis. And then the second thing that you have to worry about is the involvement of the vertebra. I have seen so many patients with staphylococcal sepsis or staphylococcal infection presenting with multiple vertebral abscesses or discitis. So when you image the uh, spine, you will find them. And it's very important if they are causing compression of the spinal cord, they need to be treated. They need to be sometimes drained. Okay. I'm just going to have a slight twist to the same problem. Same problem. I'll just add, just change a few words. Now look at this. 45-year-old diabetes comes with low-grade fever and upper backache of four months duration. Since a week, he has difficulty in walking and grade three power in both lower limbs with exaggerated reflexes and upgoing plantar. Okay. He has tenderness at T10. What is the diagnosis? So 45-year-old diabetic, longer history, low-grade fever. Since one week, difficulty in walking, both lower limbs, exaggerated reflexes, upgoing plantar, tenderness at T10. So it's not mid-thoracic, it's lower thoracic. What is the diagnosis and what treatment must be given? I think that's quite easy. That's a pot spine. Okay. Now, please remember that in a pot spine, you have a longer history, right? I can't call the previous problem uh, pot spine because that is a four-day history. I gave you a four-day history. Always remember the duration gives you the etiology. Duration tells you what is happening there. So always listen to how long it happened. So this patient is a diabetic, low-grade fever, four months duration. Okay, Since a week, so what is happening is whatever pot spine was there, since a week something happened to him and then he had difficulty in walking and then he got, you know, tenderness at detail. So if you look at pot spine, okay, people do have a long duration of whatever history they have and then they go into some kind of acute paraplegia. Okay, It's not that they had only one week, they have a longer history. Now, why does this happen? Please remember, pot spine has almost four components of reasons why you should get a neurological deficit, isn't it? Some are mechanical, like you can get, you know, the presence of a gibbous, an anterior wedge collapse, which is hitting the spinal cord and causing this thing. That's a mechanical thing. Then you can get a paravertebral abscess, which can compress. Then you can get a granuloma, which can compress. The fourth one, you can get a vascular component, which is the endarthritis. Okay, so each of this has a different prognosis, a different presentation, etc. The endarthritis can come very suddenly. Okay, the endarthritis can come very suddenly. The wedge compression can just collapse like that within a week. Okay, that's what contributes to the suddenness of the uh, presentation on a background of a longer presentation. So that is why I just changed a few words in the same epidural abscess and I shifted the lesion down because the lower thoracic is where you get the pot spine. Pot spine is not common in the mid thoracic, more common in the thoraca lumbar or the lower thoracic. Okay, So that's what I've given you here. And please remember, it can have different components. Apart from this, you can get a spinal arachnoiditis, right? So there are many, many ways by which tuberculosis can involve the spine and can cause paraplegia. So please remember that always in any patient with paraplegia, turn the patient around, look at the back. Okay, many times you're examining, examining, patient is lying like this. Where is the back? Turn the patient around, look at the back, thump it uh, for look, to look for a vertebral tenderness, look, run your hand for a gibbous. Those are very, very important to you in any paraplegia, acute or chronic. Okay, and pot spine is something that you should never miss. Of course, you have to image of course, you have to look at what component is there. And when the patient is asking for prognosis also, you have to be careful. If it's an end arthritis, patient is not going to recover very well. Okay. If it is something that can be me mechanically removed, like you remove the paraspinal abscess, you uh, fix the wedge compression, and then, you know, you remove the granuloma. Okay. 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 Prognosis you can give. So mechanical components are more easily treatable than the vascular components. Prognosis will depend upon which component is predominant in whom. Okay, fine. Now I'm going to the next case. 45-year-old housewife was lifting a large bucket of water and walking to her house when she suddenly uh, developed sudden backache and collapsed. 
the difficulty in standing up complaints of pain in both lower limbs power in both lower limbs is 2 bar 5 sensory loss 40% below knee and plantars are mute knee and ankle jerks are absent what is the diagnosis now that's a very simple diagnosis she's a wife housewife she lifting a large bucket of water walking to the house when she develops a uh, uh, back ache and she collapses like that and she has difficulty in standing up pain is there and then you got a sensory loss you got a, a knee and ankle jerks loss and the plantars are mute so what's the diagnosis here this is a very simple diagnosis it's an ibdp central disc okay central disc why both lower limbs are involved that's why i gave you as a central disc if it had been asymmetrical lateral disc pro prolapse which is the more common thing you would have got one side should have been asymmetrical okay this could qualify for the corda corner syndrome that we always talk about so please remember the relevant anatomy so usually the disc prolapses between l5 and s1 and that is going to catch most of the time the corda and not the conus remember the conus is so high up it's at l1 right so you are not going to catch a conus with a disc prolapse very unusual you want to have a conus then you should have a trauma you should have something else there ependymoma something else must have meningioma some abscess something else must come there a disc prolapse usually presents here that's why you are catching all the uh, nerve roots coming here that's why it's more of a cord and to remember the dermatomes please remember the pocket area is l1 then you keep on drawing you know lines like that lines that go down like that l2 l3 l4 l5 l5 is lateral l4 is medial and when you look at the foot okay the lateral part of the sole is s1 the lateral part of the sole is s1 to simplify we say you stand on s1 you sit on s2 that's an over simplification it's not the whole of the sole is s1 the lateral part of the sole which is what you do your plantar with that is s1 right okay but the rest of it is l5 plus please remember this diagram this is l1 l2 l3 over the knee l4 this side l5 this side and then the lateral part of the sole is s1 so in this patient when we say the sensory loss is below knee why we are saying in a corda the sensory loss is below knee and the weakness is below knee is because you are thinking that l4 l5 is what is the radicals that will be caught by this corda i mean by this prolapse okay this prolapse is going to pick up the l4 and l5 the l1 and l2 might have left earlier okay that's why we say weakness below knee sensory loss below knee but dermatomal is usually corda okay let's look at the differences between corda and conus okay corda is a radiculopathy isn't it it's a radiculopathy so radic radicular type of dermatomal sensory loss pain root pain like that we can get asymmetrical you can get a saddle anesthesia weakness is below knee plantar dtrs are less plantar is mute because it's lower motor neuron bladder involvement can be there but it is late okay now please remember a typical conus okay i'll just go one slide up the typical conus that you're talking about okay hardly causes any paraplegia isn't it because you are talking of s3 s4 now where is that s3 s4 s4 going to cause any paraplegia when you say conus you are actually meaning the epiconus it's a little above that so whatever we are describing here about weakness will always be an epiconus right so symmetrical loss of sensation perianal this is this is more of saddle this is perianal okay because s3 s4 is more involved hardly any weakness a typical conus has hardly any weakness only when you go epiconus you get a motor weakness dtrs are exaggerated again you are talking of epiconus plantars are extensor again you are talking of epiconus bladder involvement is early because that is where the bladder fibers are okay so that is a one difference this is asymmetrical radiculopathy involving multiple dermatomes has no connection with the conus which is actually a cord involvement but the conus as such doesn't cause much weakness go about it go to the epiconus that's where you get all your weakness and the bladder involvement is early right okay the causes and all you can just read up i told you most of the causes right let's go on to the next one a 45 year old worker fell from a tree and developed a paraplegia on examination is zero power in both lower limbs and the plantars are mute and he has got flaccidity right he has a sensory level at umbilicus below which he has lost all sensation what additional sign should be looked for what is the level in the vertebral column now this diagnosis is a no brainer 
he fell from a tree what will he get it's a traumatic paraplegia isn't it remember he can get zero power in both organs plantar also can be mute in a spinal shock most of the time it is placidity can be there that is the tone did, did not be there the dtrs can be you know lost but plantar also sometimes can be mute okay most of the time the plantar helps you the plantar is up going okay but sometimes in the initial part it can be good but there you have to use your common sense okay there is no paraplegia which in which you go on cutting all the uh, fibers okay so it has to be fall from a tree has to be some upper motor neuron what is a giveaway is a sensory level at the once you get a level it takes it into the cord right when you talk of patterns of sensory involvement how do you say you say if there is a level it is in the spinal cord right if it's a dermatom it is particular radical if it's a plexus then it is multiple radicals if it is a nerve say ulna nerve it's a nerve type of involvement which part of the hand does the ulna nerve supply is different from which part of the hand does the cat1 supply that's a radical this is a nerve so different kinds of sensory loss can come apart from this you have the cortical sensory loss which is when the primary sensations are intact then you look for okay now all this i am saying only because i want you to understand that when you get a level at the level of the umbilicus that means there is no differential you no more call it a radical or a uh, nerve or anything like that you are going to call it only in the cord okay what is the level in the vertebral column please remember that the vertebral column ends at l1 i mean sorry the spinal cord ends at l1 vertebra so you know the formula for the cervical add one thoracic two all that you know so when you are getting neurologically you are getting a neurological level right that is not your vertebral level that is where you, where are you going to look for the gibbous will depend on your vertic vertical level so you have to always translate it into where are you getting your spinal cord level that you have to look at the vertebral level which will actually be higher right so please remember that so t6 will actually be T nine will actually be T six in the vertebral column. So wherever you want to look for a med, sorry, want a thump and want to see a gibbous, remember you must remember this translation of the neurological or the spinal cord level to your vertebral level. Okay, let's go to the next problem. Forty five year old man with OP poisoning and sepsis due to HAP is getting better lung wise, but is unable to breathe off the ventilator. Look at him; he's an OP poisoning guy. sepsis he had he had hap is getting better lung wise his hap is clearing but he is unable to breathe off the ventilator he also doesn't move his lower limbs he doesn't move his lower limbs so he is suspected to have critical illness neuropathy or somebody is people call it cip also critical illness polyneuropathy okay he is suspected to have now i want you to answer which of these is true which of these four statements is true number 1 a facial weakness may be a feature b diagnosis is wrong or respiratory paralysis is not a feature is not a feature paraplegia is rare without sensory involvement so this is this whole thing is not cin because paraplegia is rare without sensory involvement proximal muscle is more than distal proximal muscle is more than distal now i want i take a minute and i want you to answer what is right so which of these four things is right please answer me answered yeah so let me see facial weakness may be a feature is true okay you can get facial weakness in a patient with critical illness neuropathy though it is uncommon it is more common in critical illness myopathy not so common in critical illness neuropathy but it is not against okay fine the second thing that is rises is proximal weakness is always more than distal in a cip proximal weakness is more than distal okay the second statement is wrong respiratory paralysis is a feature in all critical illness neuropathy how do you suspect it because you are like this patient patient is getting better half wise but is not able to breathe then you think he is probably having a critical illness uh, neuropathy right that's how you suspect okay and paraplegia is rare without sensory involvement is wrong 
you can get you can't make out sensation most of the time the fellow who is in uh, uh, in the icu you really can't make out whether the sensory involvement is there or not so we can't say this at all this teacher is not right so please remember when you can't wean out somebody from the ventilator in an icu uh, there are many reasons you can get sepsis you can have steroids you can have so many reasons electrolyte imbalance you know uh, uh, brain involvement all of these things can cause difficulty in weaning off a ventilator suspected to have cin is true facial weakness may be a feature that is why it becomes a differential for a gb syndrome there are patients who have been treated as gb syndrome in an icu when they actually have a critical illness neuropathy is an important differential okay fine and proximal is more than distal ci ci n and ci uh, proximal illness myopathy both have almost similar features that is more of muscle involvement pure motor ck levels can be higher that's all difference nothing much okay i'm going to the 10th case two more we have to go okay a uh, 55 year old man with ca lung comes with severe backache 55 year old man with ca lung comes with severe backache a week into admission one night he complains of difficulty in passing urine and has retention so one night he complains of difficulty in passing urine and has retention next morning the resident notices a distended bladder and upgoing plantars by evening he finds it difficult to walk to the bathroom what is the diagnosis what is the treatment so is a case of ca lung this is again a very simple diagnosis ca lung severe backache okay uh, first thing only you can think that probably mets isn't it ca lung severe backache what is it it's mets okay so he is probably got mets we can to admission look what is happening to him he has difficulty in passing urine and has retention one of the most important first signs of a paraplegia due to due to a metastasis is retention of urine bladder involvement is one of the most important first signs of a paraplegia next day you are seeing a distended bladder up going now the neurological deficit is coming up so in any patient with a, a ca whom you are suspecting is going in for a meds always examine the plantars and ask the patient if is past urine the diagnosis is <coughs> metastasis what is the treatment treatment is very very important immediate radiotherapy can save the spinal cord okay can prevent paraplegia that's why it's very important to recognize it once the paraplegia is established once the meds goes and invades the spinal cord and there is a compression collapse of the vertebra then you can't do anything about it so only the initial stage that is not involved the spinal cord that is one when you can make out and if you treat then with an irradiation you should be fine okay fine this is probably the last problem yeah i think so 30 year old lady <coughs> is treated by a doctor for uti with cotrimoxazole 30 year old lady doctor treats her with cotrimoxazole for a uti she develops severe abdominal pain unable to lift her hands up okay by evening she is not able to walk she is taken to a nearby nursing home suspected to have acute abdomen is put on nilper oral and one point of dns is started for her she recovers within one day and walks home what is the diagnosis what caused the recovery anybody please so she is a 30 year old lady treated with you for uti with uh, cotrimoxazole and uh, okay somebody said it acute intermittent porphyria correct correct that's a diagnosis now there are many many clues telling you that's porphyria number one she's got an infection the precipitating factor for a porphyria and the second important precipitating factor for a porphyria is the cotrimoxazole you know the list of drugs that cause porphyria many are there isn't it and that sulfur drugs is one of the highest then you have phenobarbital phenytoin so many things come okay so many drugs can precipitate a porphyria develop severe abdominal pain and is unable to lift her hands up right so this is one polyneuropathy which starts in the upper limbs isn't it at in the upper limbs is porphyria okay right so of the peripheral neuropathies that involve proximal more than distal you have gb syndrome porphyria and diphtheria only three things are there but of these gb syndrome descending paralysis is rare whereas porphyria starts in the upper limbs okay so starts in the upper limb by evening she is not able to walk so it's like a descending paralysis but starting in the upper limb the severe abdominal pain 
and nothing to be found. You know, all the causes of severe abdominal pain with nothing to be found. Acute abdomen mimicking a, a medical condition, mimicking an acute abdomen. One of the conditions is acute intermittent porphyria. Then you can have sickle cell anemia, mesenteric ischemia, DKA. So many causes are there, isn't it? Lower lobe pneumonia. We can go on. Okay. So there are several causes. Inferior volume. So many causes of severe abdominal pain where there is nothing acute abdomen in that, nothing surgical in them. One of the causes is porphyria. She is taken to a nearby nursing home, suspected to have acute abdomen. Somebody put her on NPO and started one DNS. Why did she recover? Because one of the treatments for porphyria is glucose. Apart from heme, which is the right treatment, glucose can decrease the production of heme and decrease the porphyrins. That is why people recover with a dextrose. Okay. So that is one thing that we should remember. That could be the reason why she recovered. And the diagnosis is acute intermittent porphyria, which is also one of the causes of not paraplegia, quadriparesis. But I just put it up because many times this also has been mistaken for a GB syndrome. Okay. So if you look at your differential diagnosis for GB syndrome, I'm starting you back to the beginning. Okay. We started with the GB syndrome. What are your differentials? You can get a periodic paralysis. Correct. Then you can get a critical illness neuropathy. Okay. <coughs> then you can get something like a porphyria. Then you can get a secondary GB and you can get your differentials for GB like HIV lymphoma sarcoid. Right. So many conditions which look like GB but are not GB. If you read the literature, yesterday I was just going through for my own uh, interest. I found so many cases being treated even with IVIG. Porphyria cases was treated with IVIG thinking it is a GB syndrome. Please remember <coughs> that when you have GB syndrome, some of these differentials must be thought of. <coughs> it's not moving again. Okay. Now, this is my last slide. I'm just, just, just listen to this approach. This is very, very important. This is probably the most important slide in my whole presentation. When you see a patient with acute paraplegia, okay, acute paraplegia meaning the paraplegia is of few days onset. The first thing that you want to know is whether it is upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron. Anywhere in neurology, when you get a motor system disease, then you know the motor system is involved. What is the first question you have to answer? Is it upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? So let's say it's upper motor neuron. Then you go down this list of differentials. I will just run through with you. Unpaired ACA, circuit onset, Headache, vomiting, seizure, everything, and the bladder involvement and motor. That is a unpaired ACA. Transverse myelitis, <coughs> definite level in the cord. Then you can get an, uh, eye involvement, first episode, many episodes, long segment, etc., etc. <coughs> that again has a sensory level. Okay. Remember, ACA will never have a sensory level because it is not in the cord. Anterior spinal artery thrombosis, dissociated anesthesia, then you have upper motor neuron. Epidural abscess, particular level, there is a tenderness at that level and there is a history of fever. Port spine, longer duration, the last part can be acute. Metastasis in the context of an already existing malignancy. And remember, in a metastasis, radiotherapy is spinal cord saving, right? So, very important for you to pick up, right? Trauma is trauma, okay. Now, if you come to the lower motor neuron, if you know that your reflexes are lost, plantar is mute or plantar is flexor, then you know this lower motor neuron, you come on this side. Like we said, the most common causes of an acute paraplegia is GBS and is variants, which you should always think of in anybody who has got a short history and a paraplegia. Hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis must be thought of. Remember, hypokalemic periodic paralysis in the adult usually means thyrotoxicosis. Always work up for a thyrotoxicosis. Send a potassium in whomever you think has GB. And IVDP is a very common disorder, often missed. Okay, often missed. I have misdiagnosed an IVDP as GBS. When I was younger, I've done that mistake. So it's just burned into my brain that I should never miss it. That is because people usually do not complain of much of pain. Sometimes they will not tell you much pain and then you get mixed up. And then if you don't examine for the sensory correctly, then you can miss an IVDP. IVDP, if it is a central prolapse, <coughs> it can be bilateral, but usually it's a lateral disprolapse. 
that's why it presents as asymmetrical aryflexic dermatomal loss uh, motor uh, involvement below the knee plantar mute that is a coda and the conus can be there if it is a higher involvement which is usually not an ivdp then you can think of cin and cim in the setting of a critical care illness or in that context okay steroids you are giving for some other thing you got sepsis all those things then you find it difficult to wean off the patient on the ventilator then you think of cin or cim okay and porphyria being the last acute intermittent porphyria neuropsychiatric manifestations can be there i have not written in that problem patient can have psychotic episodes patient can have seizures patient can have this abdominal pain and then a upper limb involvement uh, uh, neuropathy and then the patient recovers with either hemin or with dextrose and multiple episodes can occur respiratory factors in the form of drugs infections like stress etc can be seen and all you have to do is to do a urine porphyrin and you prove your diagnosis and the treatment is totally different so most of these things are uh, uh, you know differentials of the typical thing of an acute paraplegia lmn which is your gb syndrome i want all of you to do very well in your exams all the very best be confident don't get uh, what you call uh, uh, you know demotivated don't start uh, talking negative to yourself always be more confident you will do well just believe that and i'm sure all of you will do extremely well god bless thank you thank you ma'am thank you shall we stop uh, yeah thank you ma'am okay uh, if any doubt you people can ask or we will conclude the meeting Uh, sure, ma'am. Then I think uh, we should conclude. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Sanjay. Bye, bye. Bye.